All right, we're going to go ahead and get started for today. So my name is Heather Wood, and if you don't know who I am, I'm the IES team meetings and education program coordinator. So how it's going to work today, um, really informal. Um, feel free to share your webcam if you like. Um, we're going to be doing kind of a panel um, Q&A kind of discussion on um, horrible things that you can forget to do with your humidity system. But before we begin, I would like everyone to introduce themselves that is online. So what I'm going to do, I was just going to go down the list and I'll call on your name. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, let us know your name, um, company, and maybe just how long you've been in the industry. And then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see here. First on my list, I have Callie. Hi, I'm Callie. I work for Reed City Group. Um, and I've been here for almost two years now. We're ISO 8 clean rooms uh, with plastic injection molding. Next, I have Cheryl. Hi, um, I work in pharmacy at the Heartland Healthcare Services, so I'm their infusion manager and have a plenty of clean rooms. Next, I have David Gibbons. You can go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes, I have um, been working in uh, environmental testing labs for, had been, pardon me, working in environmental testing labs for about 26 years, starting with Hewlett Packard and ending up doing the same thing for essentially the same company called Keysight Technologies, retired a couple of years ago. Done a lot of work teaching about climatic testing, climatic testing equipment, care and feeding, all that sort of stuff. Next. Uh, next, I have Doug. Burnett, you're muted, Doug. Thank you. Uh, I'm Douglas Burnett. Uh, I run a test lab for a small engineering consultancy in the Pacific Northwest and have been uh, doing this about 10 years, um, first on the environmental test side and then a little more recently um, doing a little bit with uh, clean rooms. So I kind of straddle both sides of what IEST does. Um, next slide, Hannah. Hello, I work for Kimball Electronics um, in our medical device division. We do class two mainly devices, and we currently have two ISO class eight clean rooms, soon to be three. Right, next, I have Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Clark with Acumen Technologies. We do particle counting. I'm uh, expanding into uh, humidity monitoring. We've done it in uh, Lithium battery production, as well as clean rooms, uh, support hospitals as well. So, just remote type of uh, monitoring that goes over wireless systems. All right, thank you. Next, I have Julie. Hi, everybody. Julie Jennings here. I work for Lockheed Martin. I've been in the industry about 27 years. Um, my primary function here is to do all the environmental testing. So when I say that, we talk shock, vibration, uh, temperature, humidity, atmosphere, or the lack thereof, so on and so forth. And um, my role at the IEST is I'm the Vice President of Education for the DT&E side. So I work with Heather a lot to put together courses and training and that kind of thing. And this is one of the things that uh, that we like to offer is a, a, a monthly meetup so we can, uh, you know, kind of ask whatever it is that we, we, you know, what's on your mind. And so I, I really thank Heather for putting this together so that we can just bring ourselves together and share some maybe horror stories and learn from one another and that kind of thing. All right, thank you. Next, I have Mark. Oh, Mark, you're muted. It's on the bottom of your screen, there's a mute. So I'm always muted two ways, now zero ways. Yeah, so Mark Kamenzen, San Ramon, California consultant, 35 years in the industry, worked a lot with clean rooms, environmental test chambers, including urea issues for semiconductor, amine issues with hazing for humidifiers, and uh, environmental test chamber, the 
humidity system can actually mess you up if you got dirty water you're putting into it. So uh, just uh, just consulting from California for any industry, disk drive, semiconductor, aerospace, lasers, whatever. All right, thank you. Next, I have Michael. Hi, this is uh, Michael Leander. This is my first time to one of these events. I'm actually new to the group within the last year, but I've been in the industry as a general contractor, specialty contractor. I work at a company called CPRO, and uh, Jeff Clark's head might have popped up on that one. But at this company, we work within a lot of healthcare environments, pharma, uh, higher ed. And so we are designing, building, consulting, and specialty contractor, a host of different industries. Um, and I don't know if I said this already, but I've been playing this game for, I don't know, 38, 39 years now, like quite a few of us here. So I have a wide range of experiences building all of these lovely facilities that you people live through and live in. That's it. Thank you. Next, I have Ryan. Yeah, my name is Ryan Retzma. I'm a uh, technical liaison advisor for Thermotron Industries and been in the industry for about 16 years. I've uh, been with Thermotron for about uh, three years now. All right, thank you. Next, I have Steve. Hi, my name is Steve Brenner. I'm the president of the Equipment Reliability Institute. We do training in dynamics testing and climatics testing. And how long have I been doing this? Well, the first project I worked on was the uh, lunar module for the Apollo program. So I guess you could say I've been doing this forever. <laughs> One or two um, years. Yeah. Next, I have Tagui. Hi. Um... My name is Tegui Ara Kelly, and um, I work at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Um, the um, I've been in the company just short of 37 years, but I've been in this industry a little over uh, a decade. Uh, I'm responsible for maintaining proper protocols, environmental conditions for more than 100 clean rooms uh, within the company. Um, and the humidity is a big issue in Southern California. Um, uh, yeah, it's, that's it for now. <laughs> okay, and then I have Katie. You can go ahead and unmute and introduce yourself. There you go. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Higgs. I'm with NTS Labs in Baltimore, uh, and this is the first uh, S workshop I've attended, so I'm not really sure what to expect. <laughs> yeah, and you logged in. It's very informal. Um, it's going to be more of just a roundtable discussion on the topic. Um, if you have any questions, just go ahead and unmute and you can verbally ask any questions, give your experience, things like that. And then I also have online Ben Shank, who is from Thermatron. His microphone is not working right now. He's been a vibration expert for eight years. And like he said, he has no microphone right now. So Julie, you can go ahead and start the conversation. And of course, Heather hits me when I put food in my mouth, but that's okay. <laughs> that's how we roll at IEST. Um, welcome everybody. I do appreciate you coming by and taking the time out of your busy days and hanging out with us for some time. Um, Admittedly, I don't do a whole lot of the humidity testing. Uh, we do humidity testing on all the products that we make, yeah. But, um, you know, we go into the lab, turn on the chamber, or ask the guys to turn on the chamber for us. We, we run a, a pre-programmed uh, profile, typically, in the industry that I deal with. And the guys in the lab, they know how to make their equipment work. And I just sit back and watch most of the time. So we've got a couple folks on the panel that are have more experience in this area than uh, than I do. So, um, but as you know, the, our our topic today is horrible things you can or can forget to do with a humidity system. So uh, this is really like Heather said, it's an informal forum. Ask the questions. Um, I think I'm going to start with um, the guys from Thermotron, Ryan, and also. Um, uh, D Dave Gibbons, uh, kind of give us maybe your one or two things that you've seen that have, when you're working in the humidity, with your humidity systems, that um, some, you know, one or two horror stories that you guys might have of things that you've seen in the past. And then how do you 
and in the corollary to that, what are the things that you've learned to do to avoid those mishaps? So Ryan or Dave, whoever wants to go first, I guess I'm, I'm good with either way or Doug too. Sure. So, you know, I'll say that uh, uh, probably one of the uh, biggest things that we deal with uh, when customers are calling in asking for help is uh, lots of customers uh, are not necessarily aware of how pure their water is. Um, so some horror stories that I have are customers say, I got the cleanest water that you can possibly imagine. It's DI, super clean. Well, they don't take into consideration um, that super clean water can actually start to deteriorate the uh, steam generation components and can cause premature failures. And, uh, you know, we've had customers change out um, parts of their steam system multiple times in a year uh, with uh, without understanding that, look, you need to have the water pure enough, but not too pure. So jugs of um, DI water that you would go get at the Publix or your local supermarket is... Uh, from a, because I'm I'm kind of ignorant in this. Is that a, is that, at the level of goodness, above the level of goodness, below the level of goodness we want to be? No, you can't would... get DI water at the grocery store. You get distilled water. Ah, yeah. see that different. maybe we're, that's see I'm again I'm ignorant. What's what's the difference? Let's just start with that. What's the difference between the two? Brian, you want it? You can take it. Okay, the thing is. Pure, pure, pure H2O without any non-ionic or ionic components is hungry. It will eat glass. It will eat aluminum if it's super pure. Uh, I had to replace windows and chambers where that had happened, where water was being made too clean and was aggressive enough to dissolve glass. And uh, I was lucky I never had to replace damaged aluminum components like the fin coils but that's a problem. So you have to monitor the conductivity, which is the usual measure of purity that's good enough for us. Monitor the conductivity actively so that you can, with an alarm, so you can go, oops, I need to change out my DI filter or whatever it is that's making your water unsatisfactory. Uh, there's, there's a lot more there. Um, if I may, uh, may I share my screen? Sure. I think, I think you Yeah, I think you are able to. Yep. Okay, let's see if this works. Look at you, Dave. Oh, I... You're you're way smarter than me in figuring out how to make his stuff work. Oh, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> this I, I I simply put this up to present to the group. It's focused not on some of you are interested in controlling humidity in a uh, uh, contaminated contamination controlled space. Um, this is written around an environmental simulation chamber, which has humidity control. But is my cursor visible? Yes. Moving? Okay, yes. so you have an input. Water from your facility people. You filter it, usually a DI filter. You may have hopefully a pressure reduction. Then you'll often have some sort of water level control tank associated with a steamer, which is what most chambers use that then kicks the humidity uh, water vapor into the chamber volume itself. That's one thing we have to watch. The other thing we watch is the control loops where the controller, given an input from a humidity sensor, takes that data and then either drives the refrigeration system and a dehumidification coil in the chamber, or it drives the heater, usually an immersion heater and a steamer to generate water vapor to get control in the chamber. And there's this, this thing here is what I'll refer to for the um, problems that I ran into and others you might refer to. I'll unshare the screen. I've unshared the screen. So, but this is what I plan to work off of for today. Thank you. Pardon yep. the primitive graphics. <laughs> no, I love them. I love them, Dave. Uh, so, so Ben, you had a really great question, um, and because we, you know, this is this is really a, one of our first uh, 
you know, uh, webinar things where we've had both sides of the house pretty much equally represented, the CC contamination side and the environmental test side. And so Ben asks, I wonder how much confusion there is among our CC friends about the difference between an extreme test chamber and the rooms they live in with medium set points. So um, I don't know who wants to, from our panelists who might be the best suited to, to tackle that question uh, or something like that. Um, I, I guess what I'll dive in. Like extreme? And I'm sorry, could you put a little more definition on the uh, extreme? Yeah. Yeah. So, so from, from the DTE side, if I'm going to go do a, a temperature humidity test, right? I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to do a very prescriptive test that's going to say, I need to expose my widget to anywhere from 95 to 100% humidity. And you guys on the CC side, really don't want to live in that kind of environment necessarily and we're looking for different things right so on the the dt &E side i'm looking for how the 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 widget that i'm testing is going to be able to survive and function and perform over a very long duration of exposure to humidity environments that we would see in nature on our daily grind and uh, when we field these products into uh, commercial industry or military or space or whatever and then um, and then the opposite of that is we want to look at what happens in the absence of humidity environments. And I don't know if we're going to get there at all today on how we test for in no humidity environments. So, um, so that's all that I know about that side. And I'm, so I'm not real experienced on the clean room side of how you guys need to maintain your humidities and that kind of thing. So maybe you guys can help me on that. So um, I actually have uh, one of my humidity chambers is uh, was originally built as a steady state chamber for doing uh, ESD electrostatic discharge testing. So the goal was, um, in essence, extreme uniformity of uh, humidity and temperature um, in within the chamber in a steady state for really long periods of time. And um, the the concept isn't too different uh, from what uh, Dave showed. Um, it's uh, system with a boiler and uh, dehumidification coils, and um, we just run that uh, steady state as needed. Um, so from a uh, contamination control perspective, um, I think a lot of the things are uh, pretty um, similar to what happens on the DT&E side. It's just um, a question of much narrower ranges and probably tighter controls around a lot of what happens in um, a clean room uniformity. There is a question here of horsepower required. When you have to take a big volume full of hot, wet air and pull that humidity out fast because you're wanting to rapidly drop the humidity, your dehumidification capability has to be sized for that. And you are also, because we're covering such a wide range of values in a temperature humidity chamber where we're doing, as somebody said, from plus 20% to 95% relative humidity and anywhere in between and moving back and forth sometimes as rapidly as you can, the, the power, if you will, the horsepower of dehumidification and humidification is, is a lot different. Plus, your control, your, uh, I don't know if everybody is here is familiar with PID control, but your PID control for contamination control screen room, or, uh, not screen room, sorry, control, your rooms, you are operating in a narrow range. You want to pretty much be right, right in here. You're not w going from there to there. So PID control is much simpler for you. You don't have to be, you can tune more tightly in terms of your system's responses to variations. Whereas in, when you have wide ranges to deal with, you have to de literally detune your PID control. So that's one big difference is your narrow range, plus you're not trying to dump huge amounts of humidity in or take a huge amount out, unless maybe you're in Malaysia or something and somebody opens the door of the room and a big slug of, humidity comes in the room you have to deal with. Uh, somebody who has, who's in the CC side, could you follow up on what I've just said? I was gonna say, Mark, do you have a question? Uh, 
just um, typically a heater is used in an environmental test chamber. Does anyone use like ultrasonics or nebulizers to make an aerosol that then evaporates quickly, although then it leaves residue after evaporation, including little particles of maybe silica or something? Is And that is done for some clean rooms. Um, is it only for clean rooms or, and even there it's not too common, or do you ever do it in environmental test chambers? Ryan, has Thermotron been selling any nebulizers or ultrasonic? I think uh, that we have done like atomizers, but uh, you know, primarily it was just it would just be like a steam boiler, much much like the representation that you showed earlier. Right. Um, traveling in China, I think I saw one chamber over there, a uh, test chamber that actually had uh, ultrasonic uh, humidity generators in it. Um, to me, the biggest worry is that um, those are highly susceptible to, to clogging. And um, so then you're fighting how pure is your water again versus uh, how compatible is that water with the humidity generator. And it depends what you're testing. For some things, that you also make little nano or particles or nano or micro particles, depending on the total dissolved solids. If you're doing optics, it's a problem, like cameras or cell phones or so uh, we, we've looked at chambers in China and elsewhere, and there's interesting things for clean rooms and or chambers. The water purity issue when using nebulizers or spray bars or stuff just would make me nervous as heck if I was responsible to provide, not contaminate a room that's not supposed to be contaminated. I, you'd have to be riding the water quality really well. Yeah, well, like semiconductor fabs have really good ultra pure water, like 18, 2 mega ohm, whatever. So mm -hmm. there's no residue. So in, or maybe disk drive. So there you could do it easier. Although there's other ways of doing it too, that might be pretty bomb proof also. 2 mega ohm deionized, or is it actually been, is it actually gone to the point of distilling it to remove non ionic solids? I mean, Typically, it's RODI, and um, either it can be um, just uh, sometimes they can use only RO product water, mm -hmm. and, so, and then you have some dissolved solids, which is useful for not corroding your stainless steel and stuff. And then sometimes you could use, you know, like 10 mega ohm or 2 mega ohm, and then other people actually have used 18 mega ohm, which is like really, re like part per billion, part per trillion clean. Right. Um, Ray, do you have a question, comment? I see in the chat. Do you want to unmute? Or do you want me to read it? I don't know. Some people aren't able to. I'll go ahead and read it. So he said that um, currently at our site, we have no risk mitigation practices in place regarding high um, relative humidity percentages in the industry should clean room relative humidity percentages go above limits for um, above 10 minutes what are or 10 yeah what are the most appropriate actions to take our site perform, performs uh, cleaning and environmental monitoring to release the area yeah, that's a really great question um anybody on the cc side have thoughts on that I know on, at, at my end, um, we have, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, control set to, to work within a certain range, but then when extreme weather happens outside, that obviously affects what, you know, when it's zero dew point outside, it's so difficult to add enough humidity. So, um, but we still have limits set up for, for environmental monitoring to at least give us uh, a heads up. So worst case scenario, we can at least protect the product uh, before conditions become uh, dangerous for, for the product. Uh, so environmental monitoring in this case is very, very important. Uh, but the folks who are experienced in the actual controlling, they, they should say something. So to GUI, I think what I what I heard you say is, and I'm kind of looking at through the chat is that um, when uh, you have uh, standards to follow, uh, but it's more it's more along the lines of protecting your product and understanding what the product can take, and trying to 
mitigate the impacts to the product instead of uh, making the room be fully if the if there's a if there's an issue with the room it's it really comes down to product protection and the the, the product specifics so ray that may um help to answer your question i was also thinking about that with with short-term spikes and dips um humidity generally is a much more difficult thing to monitor than say temperature and so um if if you're seeing spikes um, like like that, I would maybe assume that the room is a little on the small side and more susceptible to that. There's less mass to absorb changes. Um, and the other thing that kind of concerns me about limited period out of uh, out of validity measurements um, is just uh, the uncertainty in in measurement for humidity, um, which is also significantly wider than something like temperature. Um, so I guess for something that's occurring less than 10 minutes at a time, um, yeah, it's really about product risk. Um, and I guess the question in that control chart is, you know, how, how critical is that? Um, so. Yeah. So I guess my, my question, again, is uh, since if, if I'm talking clean rooms and that kind of thing, you guys are way more smart on this than I am for sure, is when I'm monitoring the humidity and environment, do I just take one control point or do I take an average of multiple ones? I don't know the answer to that to Gooey shaking her head at Jesus. <laughs> You're so silly. You don't even know. <laughs> no, no, you do. You do know. Uh, it's, it's generally wise to uh, monitor it more than one place. And the way humidity works within the same room, humidity may not be depending on the amount of airflow in the room and how well humidity is controlled. You might have some variation of humidity levels uh, within the room. So whatever you're monitoring, you should also have some sort of a monitor very close to your product, which is the thing you wanna protect. Right, and that's kind of what, what I was thinking with when Douglas was speaking about, you know, how our, our methods for monitoring humidity are, not as great as they are with say monitoring temperature where we can and you know the 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 ways that we do that there but in the room depending on how the room is set up and the airflow across the room you can have very different answers in at any specific instance in time right but then to your point it, it's all about maybe um a, uh, it's all about protecting the product that you're looking at and in in this instance we would want to take that ex, uh, you know you'd want to take up that extra time to set up to monitor right around your your product i think that's a great idea um and and, and you kind of want to look at trends too so sure. if you're if the relative humidity seems to be heading up and up and up uh don't wait until it's already reached the your product's limit uh, try to uh, have um, mitigating, you know, have your mitigating plan in place well before and immediately getting, you know, act on them uh, before you reach that limit. So, yeah. And, yeah. And, and maybe this kind of feeds back into Ray's question as well is, you know, are those mitigation techniques, um, uh, do you, I, I, since I don't know, do you guys have a, uh, mitigation techniques that you would do does it start either pumping in more more humid air bring pumping out I, I don't know what the answer is there but is there kind of an industry standard or product standard that you guys typically follow you know because i would agree with you you don't want to oh well we're now at the pro we've reached the level where the product is, is is doesn't like this but we should have never been here if we're monitored because humidity just doesn't it doesn't doesn't change instantaneously. That's one of the things that I've that I've learned that I have learned in my in my industry time. Mr. Burnett said something here about that it's harder to monitor humidity, and I'm curious, Douglas, the uh, solid state based humidity sensors from Visal and stuff seem to be pretty responsive in my experience. I was wondering what you were thinking of when you talked about um, that part issue. Uh, kind of two things. Uh, the first is cost, um, solid state sensors versus even thermocouples. Um, there's a order of magnitude cost difference between a decent solid state humidity sensor and being able to um, put some thermocouples around a room. Um, 
And then uh, the other one's measurement uncertainty. Um, I can get less than a degree Celsius uh, uncertainty out of a thermocouple and significantly tighter with um, something like an industrial, like an RTD. Um, humidity sensors, uh, I think our expanded uncertainty on the Visala sensor we use to calibrate our chambers is 1.75%. Um, so in a tightly controlled process, that becomes a, uh, a pretty big source of variance. And I, I don't think everybody wants to be spending 20,000 a channel to get like a chilled mirror hygrometer uh, set up and do five or mm -hmm. 10 of those. So that, that's that's kind of where my mind was at. I just know that for uh, the, in the corporate environmental standards I was working within, um, I had a fairly wide window and the 810 numbers also were fairly wide. And so having the sensors be as accurate as they were was acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I think the standards, of course, may actually reflect the fact that you couldn't get really tight measurement of relative humidity. For the CC folks, are you worried about plus or minus 1% relative humidity accuracy? Where, where are you guys at? Uh, so... I assume that at least it's plus or minus 2%. Mm. So um, the, uh, uh, the instrument closest to the product, if it's getting close enough to that limit, in, 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 in our case, it's usually electrostatic discharge. That's the concern. So we want to stay above 30% and we want to stay below 70%. Um, so if we're hitting 35%, we should be covering the product and protecting it. Uh, mm. Same way at the top, if it's 65, we should be covering the hardware and stepping away from it to protect it uh, from electrostatic discharge. Because we do want to assume that there's that plus or minus 2%. It takes time until humans actually do the protecting of the product. So, yeah. Assume I, I, given, uh, so we, we, we're using a lot of fluke, uh, systems on lab, but we're not weighted to it. You know, we have different systems and, and they, they promise plus or minus 2%. So what is Thermatron? There's, there's something I have here for, uh, Ryan. What does Thermatron say their chambers can do in terms of accuracy of control of, um, uh, relative humidity. And then uh, Steve Brenner also asked, what does Thermotron recommend for the new chambers? Deionized water, demineralized water, filtered water. And so Ryan, could you pick those up? Yeah, so uh, in regards to the quality of the water, well, it, that's a great question. Uh, you, you know, I see you mentioned, uh, you know, demineralized, filtered, uh, deionized. Yes, um, yes to all, except what you'd wanna do is verify that the water uh, the water that you're feeding to the chamber falls within the um, OEM specs for the particular chamber. Depending on the type of chamber that you have, the purity of the water may differ from one chamber to another. Inside the manual for each chamber, it lists the water quality recommendations as far as feed water to the supply. So you just want to make sure that you're falling within that. And as long as your water is falling within those specs, it should be fine. Steve, Brenner has his hand up. Yeah, why would there be different specs for different chambers that are all running the same test? Well, there's different types of there's different types of chambers that we make that have different water quality uh, recommendations. For instance, our um, SM style chambers have a different water quality um, spec than, let's say, our SE chambers do. Um, the uh, numbers offhand, I, I'm not not recalling, but I know that they they do have different different uh, recommendations as far as far as speed water, primarily due to um, um, whether or not the chamber has onboard DI filtration or not could definitely um, change the quality of the water being fed to the chamber. There's also so different steamer designs that make correct. dry fat. Yep. So you're trying to. Given the how the chamber functions, just make sure I'm I'm tracking. You're, you're you're trying to produce the right environment inside the chamber, but depending on the mechanisms that make up the 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 humidity producing parts, then you have to do different things with different water quality. Is that what I'm hearing? 
That is correct. It is all dependent yep, on the specific chamber and how it's designed. Gotcha. Steve, did that answer your question? Um, yes, it did. Uh, apparently, from what I hear, that uh, some of the chambers have some built-in filtration or deionizing systems, which allows them to take water of, let's, let's call it a lower quality or water that has more contaminants in it, as opposed to other chambers that don't have those uh, capabilities. And therefore, you have to be more careful and more stringent about the water going into it. That's what I'm hearing. Yep. That's, that's, that's exactly what I was hearing as well. Um, so let's see. Um, I just kind of monitor in the chat a little bit. So, Ray, I think we kind of addressed your basic questions, you know, and with uh, the discussion from Degui, where you're looking to get away from stopping the process each time we get a get, get a blip in high humidity, and and it kind of maybe it seems that there's we could uh, improve our method of monitoring the humidity or where we're monitoring specifically. And, and that kind of thing, or are we talking about really, really tight controls on the humidity that would be uh, something that's not maybe maybe not too realistic? But uh, so, did we answer your question, Ray? I guess we'll especially use, if you're yep. yeah, oh, great. especially if he's sampling at one one minute intervals. That's uh, I don't know. That to me, that sounds uh, it sounds excessive for a humidity environment, but my my background is different probably from what you're doing um okay I any guess other thoughts yeah i i was thinking the other thing is loss function with with going back to you know effect on product um if particularly in say a pharmaceutical environment if you're writing really high humidities you may get increased mold growth and some other very undesirable things um but if if there are momentary peaks uh in humidity and ways to evaluate the effect of that on product um maybe it becomes a you know a control chart thing um back to those western electric rules or if anybody's familiar with the manufacturing side of that but um that you know maybe a few blips are completely allowable in process if there's no effect on product and taking four or five samples in a row that are above the limit um is just fine allows you to keep going. It looks like here on the chat, um, Ben has stated uh, in a chamber, you can get very low or high relative humidity by changing the temperature quickly without adding or removing any moisture. Does anyone else deal with partial pressure instead of relative humidity? I didn't. I'm just looking at what do you mean by partial pressure? Uh, ben. Maybe just not tracking your question. Be like millimeters water gauge or something, right? Or or millimeters uh, mercury, whatever. Or tour. Do they, do they mean changing the pressure in order to be able to affect changing the relative humidity? I Is believe that... it's literally partial pressure of the H two O of vapor pressure in the volume. But we're probably, Ben is probably typing like mad right now, but I will say yeah, one so thing. Just, in the background, the 8800 controller is keeping track of how much water is in the air. The, the one thing though that Ben writes in his 1036 AM post is you can get very high or low by changing the temperature scene without adding, removing any moisture. And I want to, if I may, Ben, qualify that statement, because when you cool the chamber rapidly, often the cooling coil acts as a dehumidifier and it can yank water out of the air mass in the chamber. And so you can remove moisture. During heating, the heating coils don't remove any water molecules where the cooling can and often does. Uh, and that's a, a separate can of worms. And on a separate, if you wrap, cool, right? Oh, yes. I'm just reading his comments there. Um, it looks like up above, Mark, you have another question. Oh, just for the water, um, if you're evaporating in a tray with a heater, 
do you, does everyone, uh, well, it probably depends on systems, but typically do you add it forever and it just keeps evaporating because obviously eventually you're going to get residues or oh, yes. is, is there a fixed cycle where you dump it every cycle or every day, week, month, or, or do you have a bleed and feed or what's most common? What's common is that you have somebody, a maintainer that monitors, especially when you first put it into service, that monitors the amount of gunk, speaking technically, that builds up in your evaporating pan, your steamer, whatever, and begins to say, we need to drain this or flush this or clean this on this periodicity. And you don't- So it's it, empirical. Yeah, it's empirical because you don't, right off the bat, What's the quality of the water going into that pan? And how often, how much, how many gallons are being evaporated out of that over a period of time? Yeah, so what's so, the ratio? What's the ratio? How much goes in versus how much is wasted? Is it like 1%, 10%? Oh, I think it's going to be less than 10%. It, it, it kind of depends on how tolerant you are of having potential contamination coming off with water you might be boiling off or evaporating out of that pan. Does There's, anyone have a like conductivity meter? Yeah, I, I use a conductivity meter for both the clean room stuff and for uh, chambers. I used a conductivity meter and consider it to be a must. Partly because if you're given a DI water filter bottle and it turns out it wasn't of really good quality and it's output falls off and you start getting bad water out of it, unless you monitor it, you won't know. And so it's it's monitoring both in sense of empirical of looking at the gunk building up and keeping an eye on that conductivity meter and making sure the conductivity meter is telling the truth. Yeah. All that so all that is in the package. So do you build up gunk on the conductivity cell to where it's reading wrong? I never saw that. Okay. Yeah, for me, um, never saw that either. But um, I guess our initial approach years ago, knowing that we didn't have those processes in control and knowing that we were kind of cowboying our way into being a, a big boy test lab, if you will, um, I uh, uh, water's cheap. Um, a boiler blow down uh, in the case of one of our chambers that used a very low pressure uh, Hussman boiler, uh, for instance, and that was just a monthly activity was um, get it up to temperature um, and uh, blow all the steam down that would flush out, I don't know, 75% of the buildup and the remainder was there and it was probably six or seven years before I had to do a tear down on that boiler and get the inside sandblasted. Um, but, uh, yeah, regular PMs are probably the biggest savior. Um, and uh, I would be interested in what the folks from Thermotron have to say about that too. <laughs> yeah, I would say that, uh, typically I'd recommend at least monthly, especially if it's a new chamber, I'd at least probably check it after the first month. If it's a new system, uh, to kind of get an idea of, you know, is it scaling up? How bad is it? and then flushing the steam generator um, appropriately. Um, also, if a steam generator, uh, like a chamber, isn't uh, utilized, uh, making sure to drain out that water, let's say a chamber is going to be unused for a period of uh, six months or a year or something like that, making sure to drain out residual water to prevent it from kind of getting skunky and turn nasty. So I would say, yeah, you know, based upon your um, you know, one month eval, you could say, okay, well, it kind of looks okay after one month and then starting to create your own uh, PM plan of how often you're going to evaluate it and take a peek at it. Biofouling was just mentioned. Heaven help us. I've seen green lines from algae and chillers and uh, humidity chambers. I've seen brown lines with kind of moldy, skunky looking stuff that's, um, probably mold and or if it was bad water, maybe iron oxides and things, or, or or due to corrosion of upstream stainless steel by too clean water then precipitating. Anyone else, anyone have any questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself if you guys have a question, if you don't really want to type it all into the chat box. I know it can be time consuming to do that. 
And the focus here seems mainly chambers and how much are people looking at humidity issues in clean rooms? I mean, semiconductor doesn't like urea in the water or lithography. And then there can be other other problems too. We've had major semiconductor fabs that have odors due to um, moisture landing on filters, growing mold, and then even evacuating large semiconductor fabs to where many people leave the building, which is really inconvenient. Um, I guess anecdotally, I uh, I know somebody worked in uh, process um, control and uh, fab here on the Pacific Northwest, and um, the owner of that fab actually had a staff mycologist for three years straight um, to identify uh, and help control uh, various various issues within uh, not only their clean water lines but also within the uh, uh, air environment. Um, so it's I think can turn into a really gnarly issue, um, but I'm yeah I'm not familiar enough with it to to know. I'm uh, in intimately familiar with such issues on occasion, and then in addition, humidity from outside air can be issues. You have all sorts of burning and things outside. Pre filters get loaded up with all sorts of organic matter, and even though you have a super duper fab, then you get humidity on there with temperature fluctuations, humidity, foggy days, whatever. And then you get biofouling. And um, so, you know, like my home, I've got a UV light shining on my MERV 16 filter. Yeah, I guess cleaning pre filters is one of the commonalities in my limited work with clean rooms, but also chambers and water systems is um, that's the cheapest filter to clean uh, or to replace. And I probably have those on a tighter schedule than they really need to be, but it's a lot cheaper to do that uh, on a you know two to three month basis rather than every six months um, than to deal with replacing the uh, like the the much more spendy HEPA filters and um, some of the other uh, you know sub micron water filters. And I'll just mention for clean rooms, IEST had a paper by Northern Telecom in 1986, really good one, and they uh, had issue that they use steam humidifier and steam often if it's used for all sorts of other purposes they add amines and sulfites mm. and then you make ammonium sulfites in the air and they land on surfaces and they'll haze uh, lithography which i've seen both in that paper and in a u.s factory where you have a billion dollar fab and everything's hazing up or having t-topping issues they call it due to the uh, morpholine stuff like that so uh just steam humidifiers are really tricky uh, you need the corrosion inhibitors if it's just a normal steel boiler. And if you go to ultra pure water then to get rid of all the additives, well, then it'll corrode immediately. And so you, you have to think really carefully about that. So steam, I, I, I really cringe anytime I hear steam. Maybe okay for a Sears Roebuck, but they're all gone. And uh, I'm not sure about some higher tech industries. And then Ben had said something about mold testing in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think he was in uh, when we were talking about uh, things turning green and and the like. Uh, but uh, definitely, definitely need to learn. I, I would agree with you, Douglas. So we want to we want to be sure to tackle them bec before they become a problem, because uh, it's a whole lot cheaper to uh, prevent the issue than it is to re 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 fix the problem. Or have to throw away a lot of contaminated product. Yeah, exactly. Or invalid tests. Yep. So we let's see. We've got about uh, eleven minutes left. Um, so we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about chambers and the like. Uh, Dave, you had something. I would like to return to the uh, sophisticated graphic I put up and give you guys a quick tour of all the stuff I've seen gone wrong based on that graphic, and then and then maybe we can uh, that might key some more questions. Ooh, ooh, I can I can share ways I've killed environmental chambers uh, <laughs> as you share that. Let's let's All do right. it. Uh, so go ahead, Ben. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Dave. All right. And then Douglas will get uh, go to you. Okay. So my I, uh, cursor of is visible. We see him. Yes. yes. Okay. Pl 
plant water, what quality they have, they can screw you over. Filtration. In my case, I use DI filters. You can screw up if the DI filters that are being supplied to you are not in good condition. Thus, you have to monitor, and I didn't draw it, but there's a monitor that I was using to, with a audible alarm, uh, I didn't have it tied into the LAN and the network and everything else, but at least it would start screaming if the water conductivity went out of range. By the way, I pre-filtered and post-filtered because these got messed up by bad plant water. Pressure reduction. Water level control units supplied by Thermotron and probably everybody else that has temperature humidity chambers cannot take excessive pressure. And so house pressure will cause these to malfunction. For example, overfill, overfill the steamer. And so you have water up coming up into the chamber because this has been overfilled because this level control is broken because you've overpressured it. Water level control itself can be full of contamination and has to be cleaned periodically. The steamer itself, the level control here, if it fails low, the immersion heater gets dry and burns out. And then you have uh, yet another failure plus contamination from burning out a heater. Obstructions. Operators are careless and drop things inside the chamber, which magically always found themselves down the breather tube into the steamer, which causes more problems. Contamination from contaminated water in the steamer gets into the chamber. So you have that feed chain that all has to be taken care of, periodically flushing and cleaning this, periodically cleaning this, making sure the pressure to this is adequate, making sure the filters are working right and delivering water within the specification given by the chamber manufacturer. Control loops, you have two. Here's your controller. Your controller drives that refrigeration section. If the refrigeration system is not working right, your dehumidification may not work right. For example, if the surface temperature is too low on the dehumidification coil, it will ice up and stop working right, either pulling up, yanking too much water vapor out of the air because it's at freezing or below, ranges of things that can go wrong with that, okay, your refrigeration system. So you have to have a refrigeration system that's set up right and that the dehumidification coil has the right back pressure controlled by an exhaust pressure regulator. A lot of you guys probably aren't interested in refrigeration. The Thermotron guys and the other manufacturers should be. They should be setting that up right from the factory and it should be checked periodically as part of PM. The other loop here is the drive to the humidifier. Solid state relays usually drive it. If they fail, you've got problems. But in the other part of the control loop here is the controller to the, this volume, to a humidity sensor, make sure the electronics for the humidity sensor are in good shape and are in calibration and working properly. I actually had a poor, poorly sealed opening. Humidity would come out, bathe the electronics associated with the sensor, and it went to garbage. So you can have bad RH data giving you trouble. The bad RH data can create disastrous results because if the chamber thinks it's at 0% relative humidity and you set it to 70% relative humidity, the controller will just drive this thing out flat out and you will flood the chamber with water vapor, creating rain inside, and you also dump vast amounts of heat into the chamber. There's nothing like walking up to a chamber as I did many years ago, three expensive prototypes in a stack in humidity chamber and the front panels had melted and were just flowing down the front of the instruments because Goodness. the steamer was on 100% due to a failure in the control loop. Goodness gracious. PID problems. Improperly set PIDs can cause situations where you will go over humidity during a profile. This is not with clean rooms but rather with chambers where you're going up and down in humidity and temperature, and you can drive them into a state where the relative humidity will go over 100% when you didn't want it to. And that has to do with the PIDs that you set, how you set them up and it gets complicated. I won't go into more of that. Unrealistic profiles is the other problem is you'll get somebody that will drive a profile where 
they're setting, getting the temperature of the device under test below the dew point. They rapidly raise the temperature. The device under test is massive and it doesn't change temperature fast enough and it gets below the dew point and it gets wet, which may not have been part of the design test. Right. And trying to do, last thing here, trying to dehumidify when you're down at 30 degrees C or lower doesn't work real well. And so you can say, yeah, I want to be at 20 degrees C and I want to be at 10% relative humidity. And you have just exceeded the chamber's capabilities. Its performance envelope doesn't extend there. So asking the chamber to do unrealistic things is another reason you get problems. Okay, so I will drop off the screen share again. Actually, if you want to leave that up. Um, will do. It's kind of a uh, interesting thing. So I've, I, over the years, pretty much made every mistake or issue uh, that Dave is warning about. Um, on the preventative maintenance side, I have one chamber, not Thermotron, uh, I won't name names, but it's a, uh, the other um, one. it's another one. And the steam uh, system is always under pressure. So uh, there was grit that got into that uh, solenoid valve between the chamber and uh, uh, the steam chamber and the uh, conditioned uh, environmental chamber. Um, so I came in after a Thanksgiving um, to a chamber that had six inches of water in the bottom of it, um, just because it was spraying humidity the whole time. So that cost us some product. Uh, that wasn't fun. Um, the other thing that I have run into around unrealistic profiles is um, it's it's one thing if your dehumidification coil gets iced up, um, if that's that, that theoretically should have an expansion valve on it that does not allow any refrigerant into that coil uh, unless it is at about a degree Celsius. Um, but uh, if that ices up, it's kind of bad. If your main evaporator that's controlling temperature ices up because uh, there's a ramp that's too fast um, or something, and if, if that coil can't absorb heat from the chamber because ice is a really good insulator. Um, often, instead of having uh, a gas come out of that um, evaporator, you will have a liquid come out of that. And when that liquid hits your compressor in your chamber, um, the best case scenario is that you do a little bit of damage. Um, you can, and I have blown uh, one uh, compressor um, just by liquid slugging it. Um, coil got iced up and all of a sudden that compressor was trying to compress a liquid and that uh, just doesn't work. <laughs> so. Yep. Katie, it looks like you have a comment. Do you want to unmute yourself and explain what you're talking about? I don't know if you're still here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if this really applies because we don't actually have a clean room at this facility here, but we do have a lot of temperature humidity chambers. And what thing, one thing that'll happen, most of our chambers run off a white, wet bulb, dry bulb. And sometimes you'll see a chamber reading 100% humidity. And it's obviously incorrect uh, because you can see the chamber is not rain, rain chamber. Um, and what'll happen is the, <clears throat> uh, the wick ends up like not being fully in the reservoir if someone was changing it too quickly or something like that. Um, so it's just one of those interesting things we run into because we do a lot of high humidity tests where basically we're looking for 95% or greater. Um, so it doesn't initially flag anything if someone who is not knowledgeable reads it at 100%. Um, because yeah. you would expect to see <laughs> condensation at the 100%, exactly. you know, you would want, <laughs> so if you're not, if it's, pardon me, if you're reading 100 and you're not seeing condensed moisture, then you're probably doing something wrong. I think that's, that's. Yeah, uh, it, essentially, and you really shouldn't have 100% in the in the chamber anyway. Yep. Unless, unless you're, doing you're trying, unless testing. you're phys physically trying to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then let's see, we're right at our, the top of our time. So I want to hit Mark's yeah. question real quick. And then, um, so Mark says, overload in the chamber with too many uh, units under test can have outgassing that cross can, uh-oh. It's me, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, that cross can, I'm sorry, I missed the chat then. Oh, you do, I have it here. 
Yeah. Um, overloading chamber with too much DUT can have outgassing that cross contaminates products, including due to silicones acid, adhesive sealants during tests of uh, PCBs, LEDs, cell phones, lasers, and issues with corrosion. And, and that can get into the water. So we've had some LED companies with, you know, thousands of LEDs burning in at a time. And then they do tests and uh, they cross contaminate. If you put one in or 10 in, it'd be fine. But when you have thousands, all hot as heck, it causes issues. We've had people doing that with cell phones, uh, laptops, um, cameras, lasers that can have interesting issues due to fire retardants, chlorinated, brominated materials, uh, making acid silicones like RTVs, out gas acetic acid, they can haze optics, cause corrosion. And then if it's an electrical test, you can get conducting ionic paths where an ammonium salt or something will uh, affect a high impedance circuit, kind of short it out and give false problems. So sometimes overloading can cause problems. 100% agree with you there. Yeah, I, I don't think we even touched on that. There's this whole realm of what is safe to put in a, in a chamber and, um, yeah, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, there are some chambers around that are specifically designed for wood testing because uh, wood, um, as it dries, can off-gas some nasties that'll eat up coils. Yep, I agree. All right, um, Heather, we're at the top of our time. Yeah, I did put up a poll. I don't know if anyone can access it. Um, I've never done it before. But um, if you see it on your screen, it's probably on the right hand side of your screen there's a polling tab that came up um if you have the time go ahead and answer the few that there's only two questions um from today but um, i also want to thank everyone thanks to our panelists and everyone who um participated today as well um we will be sending an email out letting you know when our next one is going to be happening for um, our monthly meetups. But um, yeah, I'll leave this up for a couple more minutes because some people aren't seeing the polling tab. Some people are. It's on the right hand side. You have to actually it, pull it up. I saw it for a moment. I don't yeah, see it. Yeah, if there's three dots probably next to your chat box. At the bottom of your screen, and oh, it might be holy. Yes, find it. Got it. Awesome. So uh, I'll leave it open for a minute, and then everyone have a good rest of their day. Thank you so much for um, coming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Great weekend. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. And I could talk a lot more about this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, these are awesome. I always learn something. Let's see. Feel free to leave if you need to. <laughs> I'm just leaving Let's it up. Now. Where do I put in my answer? <laughs> I, I hit polling. I don't see anything. I may hit it. But... That's okay. Don't worry about it. I, I haven't done this before. So, but I try it out. How do you Ms. input Leon, a choice? Now, so if you get to polling, um, do you both see the questions there? Nope. Okay. It's the bottom right. We're next to chat. There are three very faint dots. And if you click on it, you can access the polling. And I hit it and I, and I, oh, and I don't see anything. I don't, oh, wait, okay. Yeah. And then there's a little box. You got to expand and scroll through them one at a time. Uh, yep. It's very itsy bitsy and weensy. Yes, yeah, so you answer the first question is just A through E, and then the second one, there's a little box you can click into so, to suggest topics. Okay, got it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. I'm going right, to step Bye, out. Julie. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. If you guys don't finish it, don't worry about it. I have a time limit on it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's more that I cannot answer it. I see uh, it. Okay. I see the choices, but I see no... It's not letting me click on anything or give me a place. Yeah, to I don't type know. I'll have to mess around with it to try for next time. Yeah, yeah. Make, make sure you're in full screen mode. Like mine was an itsy bitsy thing above chat. So I was able to do it, but I, I had to like scroll oh, above. If you go to the chat and scroll to the top, you might yeah. see it or no. Well, I have I have the, the poll there. Okay. And it says, how do you hear about this webinar? Yep. It says A, B, C, D, E, but I don't see 
where to actually click. I think you just click to, it. Click yeah. to the left. For me, click to the left of the A and it says I used to email. That seemed hey, interesting. Heather, you need to um, extend the polling time. I can't. It, it closed. I or can't. you can't. No, it's fine. So, yeah, David okay. and uh, Mark, if you want to just email Heather, just uh -huh. you know how you heard about it. It's more about the other topics we were trying to get uh, feedback on. Right. So right. thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank Have you, ladies. Take care. Bye bye. Uh, bye.